Clinton and Obama agree to bury the racial spat. And the U of A just got whipped. It's Wednesday, January 16th. And your Daily Dose starts now. Welcome back, Wildcats. We hope you're having a happy, healthy 2008 and that your first day of classes went smoothly. Now to the latest on campus. Students with a sweet tooth have reason to smile today. The Student Union Memorial Center opened its newest eatery today specializing in cupcakes. Whipped is a full-service cupcake bar featuring a wide variety of icings, fillings, toppings, and cake flavors. The store features four mainstay flavors, Butterfinger, Reese's Bomb, Fresh Strawberry, and in a nod to Tucson's Heritage, Chili Chocolate. Some of the cake flavors include milk chocolate, blueberry, peanut butter, and even orange cream cheese, and with delectable toppings like peanuts, cherries, Oreo cookies, and sprinkles all on the menu, your ideal cupcake can be created right here on campus. Located inside the Cactus Grill on the third floor of the Student Union, the price for a basic cupcake is just $2.49. Yum. Well, I was there <laughs> earlier today, and let me tell you, those cupcakes are absolutely delicious. I'm sure. I'm sure. I can't wait to get one. Well, Clinton and Obama agreed to bury the racial spat last night at the Nevada debates as the Democratic rivals blamed campaign supporters for their controversy. Democratic presidential rivals Hillary Rodham Clinton and Barack Obama blamed aides and campaign surrogates Tuesday night for fueling a campaign contra controversy over race, jointly pledging on the birthday of Martin Luther King Jr. to put the matter behind them. At a debate in which the two sparred almost cordially, Obama suggested Clinton had taken a page from President Bush's political playbook with an earlier statement that the next president could, be, could expect to be tested quickly by terrorists. Well, Senator Clinton uses the specter of a terrorist attack with a new prime minister during a campaign. I think that is part and parcel with what we've seen, the use of fear of terrorism in scoring political points, and I think that's a mistake, he said. Clinton, Obama, and former Senator John Edwards, the only white man among the candidates on stage, settled in for their debate as the former first lady won a meaningless Michigan presidential primary, a contest held in violation of party rules. The debate also unfolded four days before the party sanctioned Nevada caucuses, the next for keeps contest in the wide open race for the party's presidential nomination. Race dominated the debate at the outset after several days of back and forth that left many Democrats worried about an adverse impact on the party's prospects for the general election. Obama won the kickoff Iowa caucuses less than two weeks ago, and Clinton countered with an upset victory last Tuesday in the New Hampshire primary. Edwards is winless, and after Nevada, the South Carolina Democratic primary is January 26th. Then the campaign explodes with nearly two dozen contests on February 5th. The Michigan primary was an election in name only, where Clinton was the, major content, the only major candidate entered. She faced competition prim principally from the uncommitted line on the ballot, an option that some supporters of Edwards and Obama advocated to embarrass her. Returns from 87% of the state's precincts showed her with 56% of the vote, and an uncommitted gaining about 39%. Pre-caucus polls in Nevada make it a close race among the three, an event spiced by a lawsuit filed by several Clinton supporters hoping to challenge the ground rules. Their objective was to prevent several caucuses along the Las Vegas Strip, where thousands of culinary workers' union employees, many of them Hispanic and black, had jobs. The rules were approved in May when Clinton was the overwhelming national frontrunner in the race, but the union voted to endorse Obama last week and the lawsuit followed. That was your campaign coverage 2008. You can count on more to come from that from the Daily Dose team. That's right, and I'll have more on the Michigan primaries later on in our show. But when we come back from break, Carrie's globally cool tip of the day. Keep it close. <laughs>
four, five, use the arms, six, seven, Welcome back, cats, and welcome back, Arizona, to my favorite part of your daily dose, your globally cool tip of the day. Well, if you're like much of this country, you know someone, or you are someone, who has committed to the second most popular New Year's resolution, quitting smoking. So just to give you a little bit more incentive to kick your habit, here are a few frightening facts provided by the Health Department of Western Australia and the CDC. Nearly 600 million trees of forest are destroyed each year to provide wood to dry tobacco. In Tanzania alone, an estimated 65 pounds of wood is used to dry a one pound of tobacco. By 2010, 87% of the world's tobacco will be grown in the developing world, but, cu but currently, the modern cigarette manufacturing machine can use up to 3.7 miles of paper an hour. And these tobacco plants use more nutrients than many other crops in vast quantities, like pesticides, fertilizer, and herbicides, which are all degrading the soil. Our cigarette butts also do a lot of damage. I thought they were made of cotton, not the most environmentally, friend environmentally friendly crop, but it seems to be often a form of plastic. The polymer acetate filters are comprised of thousands of fibers that can take up to 15 years to break down. The residue from tobacco in the butts also releases toxins in the, into the environment, as trillions of butts are discarded each year. Well, that was your first globally cool tip of 2008, Arizona. I hope you didn't forget that it's still cool to care. Hmm. Cigarette smoking, bad for you and bad for the environment. That it is. All right, well, in our continuing coverage of the primaries, Mitt Romney claimed a much-needed victory in Tuesday's Michigan Republican primary, making the race for the GOP presidential nomination anybody's game. With 100% of precincts reporting, Romney had a 39% of the vote, compared with Arizona Senator John McCain's 30%. Former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee had 16% of the vote, followed by Texas Representative Ron Paul with 6%. Former Tennessee Senator Fred Thompson had 4%, and former New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani trailed with 3%. Romney is a Michigan native, and his father was the governor of the state in the 1960s. Michigan has one of the highest unemployment rates in the country, with 7.4% unemployed, compared with 5% nationally. And the top-tier Republicans vowed to make the revival of Michigan's economy a priority. 41% of people who voted in the GOP primary said Romney's Michigan ties were important to them, according to exit polls. Huckabee was able to capture the Iowa caucuses with strong support of evangelicals, something he was unable to repeat in New Hampshire or Michigan. McCain won the New Hampshire primaries by appealing to independents as well as Republicans, but McCain was unable to recreate his 2000 win in Michigan when independents and Democrats voting in the Republican primary allowed him to top then-Texas Governor George Bush. The next contest on the Republican primary calendar comes sa Saturday when the Republicans fight for South Carolina. On the Democratic side, New York Senator Hillary Clinton was the only frontrunner on the ballot. Party officials voted to strip Michigan of its Democratic delegates for its decision to schedule the primary so early. In a show of solidarity with the party, the top-tier Democratic presidential candidates, except for Ms. Clinton, asked that their names be removed from the ballot. But some Democratic leaders in the state urged supporters of Senator Barack Obama of Illinois and former North Carolina Senator John Edwards, Clinton's closest rivals, to vote uncommitted in the primary. Under state law, their supporters cannot cast write-in votes for them. But if at least 15% of the voters in the congressional district opt for uncommitted, delegates not bound to any candidate could attend the national convention. That could allow Edwards or Obama supporters to play a role in candidate selection if the national party changes its mind and decides to count Michigan's delegates. With 100% of the precinct reporting, Clinton had 55% of the vote and 40% of the Democratic primary voters had selected uncommitted. It's anybody's game at this point. Now it is. Yeah. Now it is. Well, now it's time for my favorite anchor, I mean segment, and now we're going to go to Jess Antonio with a look at sports. Thank you, Carrie. That was wonderful. Hey Wildcats, I'm Jess Antonio. Welcome back to the UATV Sports Lounge. Sit back, relax, and let me read you some words. Well, Happy New Year, Wildcats. Wildcats, glad to see you all survived Y2K. We have much to talk about since we last saw one another, from national championships to steroid allegations. So, without further ado, here is your recap on what has happened in the sports world since our last Daily Dose.
In the showdown for the NCAA Football National Championship, the number one Ohio State Buckeyes faced the number two LSU Tigers in a game that was sure to be quite the battle. It was Ohio State's second consecutive trip to the National Championship and their chance to prove that last year's collapse against Florida was a fluke. Unfortunately for the Buckeyes, they proved to be just as unreliable this time around. LSU handled the game easily with a 38-24 win, becoming the first two-loss team to win the BCS title. Congratulations, LSU. Why don't you come play for us at Arizona, because we need some wins. Well, the long-awaited Mitchell Report was released in a 400-plus page document put together by Senator George Mitchell, which named more than 80 current, former, and, oh, and current Major League Baseball players who had connections to steroids. Now, the biggest name on the list is pitcher Roger Clemens, who has seriously denied these allegations. Clemens held a press conference about a week and a half ago to tell the truth to everyone that his former trainer, Brian McNamee, was lying when he told Mitchell he personally injected Clemens with steroids. Clemens claims he was injected with nothing more than vitamin B12, and in a recorded phone conversation between himself and McNamee that he played for the media during that press conference, Clemens repeatedly asked McNamee to tell the truth. Now take a look at this picture from his rookie year up here in 1984. See how skinny young Roger looks? Now, compare it to the picture of Clemens from last season where he is much, much bigger. You be the judge of this one, folks. Not that I have led you in any direction by doing that. Well, the Arizona basketball team went four games without freshman star Jared Bayless and they lost three of the four, proving that as the leading scorer and assist man on the team, he is pivotal to the team's success. In his first game back, Bayless dropped 33 points on the University of Houston, going 18 of 20 from the free throw line and going to the hole at will. He is truly the man. But sadly over break, the Cats lost to our rivals, the Arizona State Sun Devils, in overtime last week after 12 wins in a row against our rivals. The team is currently 11-5 and and play in the Bay Area this week against Stanford tomorrow and Cal on Saturday, so be sure to check out those games. We need those wins. Well, that's all the time I got for you, Wildcats. Keep tuning in to Daily Dose every Monday and Wednesday to see all the best-looking news and the best-looking anchors. Can't wait to toss it back to my favorite anchors. I live in AZ South, Arizona Sonora, and my major is pre-business. And I'm Alyssa Lazarus, and I live in Arizona Sonora as well, and my major is communications. <laughs> Two, three. You're watching UATV. <laughs> Welcome back, Wildcats. I'm Rebecca Greenwald with a quick, a quick recap of celebrity news that happened over the holiday break. Just three days after the beginning of winter break, shocking news revealed about Britney Spears' 16-year-old sister. Jamie Lynn Spears is expecting a baby. According to OK Magazine, Jamie Lynn announced that, her fa the, that the father of her, of her baby is Casey Aldridge. Jamie Lynn is the star of a popular Nickelodeon show, Zoe 101, and there is no plan to stop the production of the show at this time. Trying to keep sober, actress Lindsay Lohan slipped once again. Paparazzi caught her dancing and then taking a swig of champagne on New Year's Eve at the Capri Hollywood International Film Festival in Italy. According to People Magazine, Lohan's lawyer Blair Blurk said that it was a minor slip up and Lindsay is back on track with sobriety. Yet again, Spears' family went through another family disappointment. On January 3rd, there was a bizarre guardian dispute between Britney Spears and KFED's attorneys. Well, Britney Spears locked herself in her two, with her two sons inside a bath bathroom for four, three hours at her Los Angeles home. Spears would not give up her children to attorneys and then was taken back to the hospital in an ambulance. 
for being under the influence of an unknown substance. Spears was released from the hospital two days after the dispute. Well, on lighter news, on the 11th, Nicole Ritchie and boyfriend Joel Madden had a baby girl named Harlow Winter Kate Madden. Then on the 12th, singer Christina Aguilera and husband Jordan Bratman welcome a baby boy named Max Leron Bratman. Well, that's a wrap up for all your entertainment news for tonight. I'm Rebecca Greenwald for UATV. Have a great night, Wildcats. And that does it for us today, Cats. It was lovely being back. But don't forget to stay in touch by tuning into Daily Dose Monday through Thursday at 6.30. Tonight on UATV, once at 7. Waitress at 9. Followed by Simply Irresistible at midnight and A Life Less Ordinary at 2 in the morning. For all of us here at UATV3, I'm Carrie Sherman. And I'm Spencer Lubitz. And, and that, that was, was your, your Daily, Daily Dose. Dose.